You are listening to The Culture, a podcast on race and politics. The Culture. Hello, I'm Randolph Bracey, and I'd like to welcome you to The Culture, a show where we explore different topics of race and politics. In this episode, we'll look at reparations through the lens of lynching in the United States. I live in Florida, a place that is known for its beautiful beaches, warm weather, and relaxing tourist destinations. Most people don't know that Florida has had the worst record of racial violence and discrimination of any state in this country. Some historians say Florida was the birthplace of the civil rights movement. After the brutal bombing of NAACP pioneer Harry T. Moore on Christmas Day, 1951 in Mims, Florida, the national attention sparked the black movements of the 50s and 60s. But in regards to lynching, Florida has had the most lynchings of any state per capita in the country. As I researched lynchings through the South, and in particular Florida, there seemed to be one common thread. There were Blacks who had substantial wealth for that time period. They owned a considerable amount of land, and the Whites, through terrorism, sought to take their land. Listen to this account of a massacre that happened 100 years ago in the city of Okoe, a place where I currently live. The Ku Klux Klan the day before had warned the Black folks in Orange County don't y'all think about going to vote now. Not nearly one of you will vote, you hear? Don't stir up no trouble now, they'd say. But there were meetings going on in our neighborhoods quietly and fervently at the prayer meetings and Sunday services where people were getting registered to vote. However, as I remember it on election day, just about any black person that went to vote that day was turned away. But a Koi resident, Moses Norman, whose nickname was Mose, decided to seek the counsel of Judge John Cheney. Mose Norman owned a lot of land, and people in our community listened to him. He and Julius Perry, who was known as July, were the main ones registering folk at church. He was operating independently as the go-between amongst the black workers, and the white business folks in the area. Judge Cheney at the time was running for state senate. He convinced Mose in July to register all of us black folks and vote. Judge Cheney promised if he was elected, he would make things better for us. So when election day came, Cheney told Mose to collect all the names of the black folks who weren't allowed to vote and all the names of the white poll workers who didn't let them vote. Cheney said, if you survive, a lawsuit could be filed if they violated anyone's voting right. With this plan in mind, Mose returned to the polls in Okoye, insisting on being able to vote. Those white folks were so mad that Mose had the nerve to tell them he and his people had the right to vote, they mumbled and they grumbled. The Ku Klux Klan started rallying with their white sheets and sent out threats to us in the black community. Soon after, they got their guns and came charging through our neighborhood saying, these niggers need to be taught a lesson. And before you knew it, they had an armed mob looking for Moe's in Okoye in our part of town. They were walking right into our homes and taking them over. They were shouting, where's Moses Norman? None of us were saying anything. So they started setting our homes on fire. After a while, they stopped asking where Moses Norman was. They was just setting houses on fire with the people in it. Then I heard somebody shout out from fear, I guess. He's with July Perry. Them white folks all knew where July Perry lived because he owned more land than most of them. They couldn't stand knowing that. And they always kept saying, 
Something needs to be done about them niggas. They own too much. That should be our property. So they marched over to July's land. But I heard July was ready for them. He was the type who didn't scare easy. So when they came after nightfall and kicked in his door, it was said he started firing his shotgun, killing two of those white men right off. While that was going on, folks said Mose Norman ran for his life out the back door and over to warn Reverend Maxwell and his family. Mose took off again, and no one has ever seen or heard of him since. It seemed like the word went out to every white male in Orange County. The mob numbers grew, and their mob leader was the old Orlando police chief, Sam Salisbury. Sadly, I was told that not long before sunrise, the mob lynched July Perry and left his bullet-riddled body hanging in the Orlando city streets on a light pole or on a light post so that everyone could see. And as a warning to anyone who considered resisting as July had done. But the KKK and the mob were not finished. They went back to Okoye in the middle of the night, shooting, killing, and burning anybody with a hint of black in their blood. There were mamas running around carrying their babies as bullets were flying past them. I've learned that one pregnant woman and her mama, knowing they would not be able to outrun the mob, just sat in the house as their home burned all around them. Their bodies were found partially burned under the house. Oh, my God, the smoke, the panic, the despair. By morning, after the massacre, there were no colored people left in our section of Okoye. Black folks in other areas were warned to sell or be driven out, losing their homes, their possessions, and their property. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. After the massacre, the whites that were left in Okoe schemed with the local courts to have the land ownership transferred to them. Over 330 acres of land was stolen that day in 1920. Land worth over $5 million today. But this land taking wasn't an anomaly. Land was a priority for black families after the Civil War, when nearly four million people were free from slavery. In 1865, just before emancipation, the Union Army General Sherman met with 20 black ministers in Savannah, Georgia, and asked them what they needed. In resounding unison, they claimed that land was what they needed to move on from slavery. General Sherman issued a special order declaring that 400,000 acres formerly held by Confederates be given to African Americans, what became known as the promise of 40 acres and a mule. Obviously, the promise never materialized, but near the end of Reconstruction, a new group of black landowners were establishing themselves. Many had experience in the fields, and they and they began buying farms and land throughout the South. By 1920, African Americans made up 10% of the population, but represented 14% of all Southern landowners. Because of the wealth accumulation in the black community, a white supremacist backlash swelled throughout the South. The terrorism, the violence, the lynchings instituted by poor whites toward blacks during this time period. It wasn't about race, it wasn't about skin color, or some arbitrary story of a black man whistling at a white woman that sparked some race riot. The violence was about black wealth.
And that's why I believe that there's a legitimate claim for reparations, not just for the pain and suffering, the generational trauma, the forced labor with no pay that was inflicted on blacks for hundreds of years, not even for the actual calculable documented wealth theft that was supported by governments and the courts throughout this country. But because I don't believe we can achieve true reconciliation until a wrong is made right. As a state senator, I filed a bill for reparations for the descendants of the Okoe massacre. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this matter. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thank you for listening to The Culture. To lend your views on this topic or other issues of interest to you, please go to RandolphBracy.com or follow at Randolph Bracy on all platforms. The Culture. So, hello everyone, Senator Bracy. I represent the 11th district in uh, Orange County in Central Florida. Um, I have chaired uh, numerous committees, uh, criminal justice committee I was the chairman of, and actually I'm getting the video now, I'll send it to you while I'm speaking. But, um, and so, uh, but, but anyway, so I've chaired this criminal justice committee. I have, um, worked on numerous committees, uh, appropriations committee, but uh, my, my forte and my passion is criminal justice reform. Um, the Okoe massacre is an incident that I came to know about. I actually live in the city of Okoe. It's, it's a small city in central Florida. And I found out about it really through an older lady uh, when I won my seat, I decided to move my office into Okoe, and the older lady couldn't believe it. Uh, she still to this day wouldn't go to Okoe because of the history of Okoe. And so just to give you some background, and, and the video was going to talk about it, but in 1920, on the presidential election, uh, November 2nd or 3rd, depending on uh, when you decided it happened, it went throughout the night into the third, but it was the presidential election. You had a man named Jer July Perry, who was a very wealthy man for that time. He uh, owned a considerable amount of land. He was like a broker uh, for that town for black and white workers. He had whites as well as blacks working for him. Um, and kind of as a broker for other businesses, farming businesses uh, during that time period. And so there was a tremendous amount of jealousy uh, against July Perry. One, just because he was wealthy and, and consider that a hundred years ago, having white people working for him, having a considerable amount of land. But anyway, um, so not only did he have a lot of wealth, but he organized the black community in that area to go out in mass and, and register to vote. And so you had at that time a considerable, considerable amount of black people also that owned their land as well. Uh, and so with that, with the organization of people going out to vote on election day, poll taxes were paid. Uh, you had a, a backlash where they were turned away but they refused, uh, uh, well, they were turned away, they came back, and uh, what happened after that was uh, pretty much a massacre. You had uh, a man who kind of worked with, in partnership with July Perry, a man named Moses Norman, who was chased by a mob. Uh, a mob ensued because uh, basically word went out throughout Central Florida, not just in Okoe, that um, there was this riot ensuing. You had these black people who were trying to vote. And so the word went out and you had 
uh, tons of people come to Okoe looking for Mose Norman and July Perry. So as they were going to July Perry's house, they went through the black community, burned the entire uh, black community to the ground, churches, homes, shooting and killing um, black people. And, and eventually they made it to July Perry. Word had gotten to July Perry that this mob was coming. He had his family in his house. And so him and his daughter got their guns and just started shooting as they started coming in. And so two uh, white people that came in were killed, but they eventually got July Perry out. They shot him numerous times, but they took him up to Orlando. He was taken to jail, but then the mob got him out of jail, lynched him. And it's known to this day as the Okoe Massacre. It's the bloodiest day in American political history. Uh, no day was like that day on, on, on a presidential election, still to this day. And, and so it's a story that not a lot of people know about. Um, but I thought that it was important to tell the story. I, I found this story so fascinating. It was approaching the 100th year anniversary of this massacre. There had been conversations amongst uh, some of the presidential candidates about reparations. And I thought that this was an interesting case, I thought, to introduce reparations because this was a situation where not only did they burn the people's houses down, but the state and the local uh, courts schemed to basically transfer all the property into the people that were in the mobs, uh, into their names. Um, and in the deeds, it, it said once it was transferred illegally, that it can never be sold back to a, a black person again. So I thought it was interesting, not not just for like the generational trauma of of inflicting terrorism on a group of people. I mean, we see that throughout the history of this country, but you actually had state supported land theft, which was a little bit uh, different, a, li a different perspective than I, I usually saw. So I put forth a bill that would, um, one, educate students about it. it. It would be mandated to be taught in public schools. And then also, I wanted to memorialize it so that it wouldn't be forgotten. So in the bill, the state, the Secretary of State is directed to um, name state facilities after victims of the Okoe massacre. Um, Secretary of State and also Orange County Public Schools have to look for uh, naming opportunities of schools. So that is, uh, that was the crux of the bill. And, and uh, I don't know how long we have, Dr. Shakur, because um, I'm, I'm going to uh, need to leave in, at, at about 5.45, but I just want to- oh, that's fine. I know okay. Charlene told me. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, so that was the crux of the bill. I also had uh, reparations in there, starting at $25 million for the descendants of the victims of the Okoe massacre. And um, that's that was the bill. And so I had worked before the legislative session started. I knew it would take some working to to get this idea of reparations to pass through the legislature. It's a conservative legislature. And so it's, it's I, I knew it may have some challenges. So I, I started early, engaged the Senate president and talked to him about the story. He read about the story and he, he wanted to do something. And so uh, it's, it, I had the support of it before we even reached our legislative session, which, which, uh, which really helped. Now through the process of, of going to different committees and being negotiated, it got to the point where the Republican uh, leadership, uh, just uh, the Republican senators 
couldn't deal with the reparations portion. They were okay with the education part, the memorialization of it, but um, the reparations was was controversial. So I was given a choice. If I was going to continue to move the bill forward, I would have to take that piece out. So I did, uh, and the bill eventually passed, and and it's 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 historic in nature, even though it didn't have what I wanted. But uh, the fact that a story like this will be mandated to be taught in our public schools, I think is a win, because I think it's important that we look at our history in America and Florida really for, for what it is. And that's kind of where I was starting with uh, that podcast is that, you know, Florida is known for uh, the serene, beautiful place uh, that people come to, but its history is quite dark. And what was interesting as I put the bill forth, I had people reach out to me from across the state telling me about other incidences similar to the Okoe massacre, like one in Perry or one in, um, uh, where is it? Somewhere in Alachua County. I mean, they're, they're dispersed all over the state. You had lynchings and land takings uh, that were motivated by black people who had considerable amount of land and, and, and wealth for that time period. And so there was a, a narrative that I, that I saw that I, I didn't even realize that, it, you know, it wasn't taught. I mean, I knew somewhat about it, but not specific incidences in Florida. And so it was quite a learning experience, but, yeah. but that's, that's, that's where that, that journey took me. And so the governor just signed it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so it's, it's law. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to open it up to uh, the class to ask uh, questions. We're very fortunate, as I said, to have Senator Bracey here. Um, it's very rare that you have someone who actually uh, pushes through legislation and then you're able to talk to them about how it directly affects you, in particular as uh, future educators, as all of you here are. So I know Senator Bracey has to leave us at 545, uh, but I'd like to open the floor for questions. You, you can put them in the chat or turn your mic on. I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Since the start of um, you trying to, you know, pass this bill and address everybody about, you know, like the reparations, what would you say was like the most um, opposition that you got? And like what, uh, what were the challenges right, right from the start about, you know, educating on this, like such a, you know, important subject, um, especially in the state, but, um, you know, tr ultimately trying to reach your goal in with, like reparations? Well, the challenges were getting the key lawmakers on board. That, that was the biggest challenge. And really it didn't pass until the last couple of days of the legislative session because even though I had worked with the Senate president who pretty much sets the agenda for the Senate and he gave his blessing to push it through the Senate, I didn't have the same, it didn't have the same path in the house. and so. I moved the bill all the way to the Senate floor and passed it, but it didn't even get a hearing in the House. And so what I had to do was amend the bill onto a Holocaust education bill, which I find interesting because the bill actually, my bill just became an education bill about a certain event in our history. But the Holocaust bill moved in both houses with no problem, but the African-American education bill didn't move in the house. Anyway, I had to amend it onto a Holocaust bill, get the, the the sponsors of those bill to let it get on that bill. Uh, and so it, it just, it took a lot. And, and, and really, there was still opposition, even on the day that it passed the house. It wasn't until the house sponsor of the, of the Holocaust bill decided that he wanted it on the bill and he gave his blessing and he's a powerful house appropriations chairman. 
And so he pretty much shut down the noise in the house that said, if you have anything to say about this negatively, just shut up. I don't even want to hear it. Um, he shut down all the opposition. So I think my point is that I got key allies that helped move it forward. I, I couldn't have done it by myself. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. So not in, not just in this case, like in many instances, people push away learning the about African American history. Why do you think that's the case? <laughs> um, I think that America has they have a problem facing its truth, the, the, the truth of who we've been as a, as a country. Um, you know, it's interesting. I had a guy who, the mayor of the city of Okoe, um, he, he has fought me tooth and nail on anything I've done regarding July Perry, uh, anything regarding the Okoe massacre. He claims that only two people died, um, and he <laughs> he makes it a point to come and interrupt me whenever there's something reported or I'm quoted, say you're just wrong, and just to diminish the uh, the, the diminish what this event really was. And so, I think I just highlight that to, uh, to say it's indicative of I think the mindset. I, hopefully, I think it's changing, but I think America has had an issue with dealing with our past um, and, and being truthful and honest about what has taken place. And that's why I think, you know, reparations is an uncomfortable conversation for some people. But when you look at the wealth that has been taken, um, you know, by force really, um, it, and then even after lynching was abolished and you had policies where blacks just couldn't get loans that just widened the, the, the wealth gap in America. Um, and so many other policies. Uh, I had another bill. But anyway, just, just to answer that question, I, I, have, I think we just have an issue facing our true selves as uh, America as Americans and what this country has been. And I think until we can do that, uh, we, we can't really go forward in the, in the right way. So Senator Bracey, um, this is Dr. Shakir. So you mentioned that the Akoi massacre now as a result of the law um, will have to be taught in uh, public schools K-12. Uh, have you started developing the curriculum for that at this point or where are you right now in terms of how that lesson uh, will be incorporated into the larger curriculum? So the African American Task Force Education, African American Education Task Force has to make re recommendations to the uh, Education Commissioner on how they believe it should be taught, what should be included. And so that of course, for for our students on the call, mm -hmm. sorry to cut you, but our students mm -hmm. on the call, just in case you don't know, Dr. Bernadette Kelly, uh, who is housed at FAMU in the College of Education, is the chairperson of that task force and has oh, really? for how many years? A long time. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Well, that's that's the task force that will We'll be making those decisions. I've had um, I've had the great grandson of July Perry and relatives who want to be, I guess, consultants or just have some input if they can make a presentation to that task force. They just want the history to to be right, and so they they have some interesting perspectives on stories that have been passed down from their grandparents on what really happened and. 
So I'm going to make that introduction at some point, but, but thanks for reminding me of that. Okay, any other questions? Remember, Senator Bracey has about 15 more minutes left with us. Other questions? I have a question. So the lady that introduced the story to you, mm -hmm. the history, um, mm -hmm. did she live through it? Because I remember you mentioned that she said that she wouldn't move back there. No, well, no, she didn't. She was just an older lady who lived in Central Florida. And so she didn't necessarily, I should back up. She didn't in introduce the story to me, but she was so surprised that, that I would put my office in Okoe. And it, by this point, Okoe had a diverse population. So her perspective kind of puzzled me. And when we got to talking, you know, Okoe was what they called a sundown town where even like when she was younger, where blacks weren't allowed to come in there unless you had some business to do and you had to be gone before it turned dark. Um, I mean, it had signs that said, you know, this is a sundown town. And so the vestiges of the massacre lasted well after the 1920 incident where a, a black person was not recorded as moving back to Okoe until the 80s. And so for a lady who, you know, grew up probably, um, you know, in the 40s or 50s, and she, even though she wasn't there for the Okoe massacre, she was there, she remembered how Okoe was even a couple of decades after that incident. And so, I mean, for an older person who remembers it being a sundown town, they just, she still didn't come to the city of Okoe, even though things had changed. And so that's what made me just research the, the history of Okoe a little bit more. Can you talk a little bit more about um, some of the historical resources that you use from the state of Florida archives in order to reconstruct the story of Okoye? To reconstruct the story? Of... Yeah, because, you know, there are all these people, like you mentioned, who had argued that it didn't really happen. If it did, it had only been small numbers of casualties. I know Apaga, you know, did a lot of work with writing that kind of report, but... But I know yeah. you also had done some early research, you know, in your leisure time, if you could call it that. Yeah, well, oh, so there is uh, some, there, there have been some task force that did some research on this, on the, um, the Okoe massacre. There was one law review article that helped me probably more than anything and it was from the William and Mary Law Review. Coincidentally that's where I graduated but um, it was a person who just did this extensive uh, research uh, about the Okoe massacre and it was it was done in a way that made the case for reparations and so she talked about it from a legal perspective and how a person should go about uh, seeking reparations um, in that article. And so that it, it was such a well done article. I actually reached out to the person. We got connected. I was, we went to the same school. She was uh, years behind me, but she's now an attorney in Orlando. She grew up in Central Florida and heard about the story. And so when she got to college, I guess she decided to, to do uh, a law project on on it and so i she's one of the first persons i would reach out to when i filed the bill she was a resource also commissioned a study from our state research arm that that came to okoe did like a, a about a six month long research project and i did that because if you've ever heard of Rosewood, they did a movie about it, but Rosewood was, I believe, still to this day, maybe the only state legislature that, I mean, that's the only uh, incident that had uh, state-sponsored uh, reparations. And so what they did was they commissioned a study that kind of laid the groundwork for 
the the reparations. And so that's what I tried to do by having a study done first so that you know certain things couldn't be disputed or at least it was it was researched to the best of uh the state's ability okay any other questions <laughs>